happening. Hangout is live, it says. Ah! Let's wait for a second. Oh, can you actually uh, turn off of your screen sharing, making sure that we can turn it back on? And I see it live. Outstanding. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or in Phil's case, very, very early. It's actually his house isn't even awake, and he's got little ones out there. So very early. Is, is it still dark there, Phil? It's very dark, yes. It's yeah. five in the morning. I, I appreciate you waking up. Um, soon it won't actually be dark at five in the morning. It's going to start being light. Um, so this is an interesting story. This whole presentation, this webinar, and this um, topic that we've chosen is that at the last year's Microsoft Data Insight Summit, now rebranded as the Microsoft Business Applications Platform Summit, um, one of the people from APRESS came over to me and said, hey, Chuck, we're always interested in getting new present or new authors on books in the uh, data science space what topics do you think would be interesting? And I said, well, DAX is definitely one of the hottest topics in our webinars, our blog posts, um, and our content in general. She goes, that's great. Do you have anybody that would be interested in a DAX topic? And I'm like, you know, one of my new MVPs, actually, because you were freshly minted at that point, if I remember correctly. That's right. Um, was standing nearby, and I said, I would like to introduce you to Phil Seamark because he said he was to be interested in doing things like that. How's the journey been? What what is that like? Um, I want you to turn on your your sharing, see if we can get you reshared, and actually tell us all about that journey and talk about what we're going to present today in um, today's session. And it looks great. I can see it fine. So, um, Phil, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Chuck. And um, I'm really looking forward to uh, coming to this year's Data Insight Summit. I already have my flights booked and uh, excited to meet as many people as I can over there um, on, on my book. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great opportunity, um, which I jumped at. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to go. Um, I'd never written a book before. I hadn't written much before apart from blogs. But um, yeah, it, it was good fun. Um, it was a lot of work. And, and certainly as I got close to deadlines, I, um, uh, you know, I did have to put a lot of time into it. But um, I certainly I learned a lot more about DAX than I, I um, I knew before, which I, I really enjoyed. I, th I think when you have to put yourself in a position to uh, not only explain a concept to someone else, but explain it in a way that you think they will understand, um, yeah, y you definitely polish off a lot of the edges. And um, uh, if, if it's useful to other people when learning DAX, then um, that will be a, a brilliant thing. Um, it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, the APRESS site. Um, uh, yeah. It, it, it's ideal for someone who is, is learning Power BI, but there is also some advanced content as well. Um, in fact, what, what I'm going to be talking about today in this webinar um, is, is covered in one of the chapters in quite a bit of detail. So if you do enjoy today's session and you would like to know more, then certainly if you go and get the book, um, it will be recovered in just one of the chapters um, with, with you know, quite a bit more explanation and detail. So on that, um, let's let's jump in because we've, we've only got an hour. I, I do have about two hours worth of content. Don't worry, I'm not going to um, uh, rush all of that through or, or, or go the, the full two hours. Um, but let's see how much of this we can get through. Please feel free to fire questions via the chat window. Chuck will um, let me know and um, we'll look to address that. Um, at the end of the session, I will make the, the PBIX file that we're going to be using available for download, including my notes. So don't worry about writing anything down furiously um, because the content will be available for, um, for, for detailed study. So on that, um, let's get into it. Um, what we're going to be doing today is not importing any data whatsoever into Power BI. We're going to be using DAX to fully generate all of the data that we that we need. Um, the exercise of today is to generate um, a fake data model that's semi-representative of a sales model for a company. So it will look very, what we're going to do is we're going to create a date table, <clears throat> we're going to create a sales table, and we're going to do some things like um, uh, summarize that sales table and look at different ways that we can optimize DAX. Um, uh, I'll, I'll show you how some useful, very f uh, free tools such as DAX Studio and uh, SQL Server Management Studio can be used to help make your um, DAX run faster. So let's launch into it and, and go over to my uh, data view and um, use my favorite tab for today, which will be create a new table. Um, now, if you're using DAX for Excel, this new table button doesn't exist for you. So this is 
very much optimized for Power BI, but a lot of the DAX techniques I will share with you um, uh, will be uh, useful in, in Excel. So the very first table I want to make is a numbers table. Uh, I'm going to call my table numbers and the code I'm going to use is generate series 1 to 100. Oops, I don't want to add columns. Here we go. So we've, we've now generated um, our first table, which is a single column table with 100 rows. The 100 rows are controlled by the first and second parameters of this function. The third parameter um, can control the skip of the number generation. So if I change that to a two, we can see now that it starts with one and jumps every second number. But and that's optional. So we can take that out and just have a um, a, a table with values between one and a hundred. Now this is going to be a utility style table, which I'm not going to use in my end data model, but I am going to use it to help create data in a, in a random way. Um, let's say I don't like the column name here. Now I could right click on the column header and simply rename it um, using the UI, um, or if I want to rename in DAX, I can use the select columns function. I'm going to select uh, the columns that I specify from the nested table, and I'm going to call this column name N, and the column name I'm going to use is the value from the generate series. If I press enter now, that's effectively a DAX way of renaming the column. So I have a single table called numbers with a column called N with values 1 to 100. So inevitably, every single data model you're likely to work with is going to need a date table. So let's, gener let's see how you might generate that in DAX. So we're going to go new table here. I'm going to call it dates. And we're going to use variables um, to construct this. Uh, so let's start with our first one. Var base table equals. When you use the var keyword, what you're doing is instigating a new level of variable scope. Now, I'm quite surprised even still today how some very experienced people who have used Power BI and DAX for a long time, and we're talking some MVPs as well, suddenly go, hey, wow, I didn't never realize you could use variables in DAX. So um, if you already knew this, fantastic. If you didn't know this, I think you'll find it a really nice way to help break up and, and um, uh, make your DAX, complex DAX statements easier to um, build and maintain. So we're going to create a variable called base table, and we're going to store into this variable the output of a um, function called calendar. Calendar is going to return a table. We're going to have to provide a start date. date. I'm going to start with the year 2016, the 1st of January, and I'm going to end with today. And when I click OK, I'm going to get an error. Um, and that's because for every time you introduce a new level of variable scope using the var keyword, you need to close out that level of variable scope with a return statement. And I'm going to be returning that variable. Oh, so we now have a calendar table with a single column that starts on the 1st of January 2016 and will go all the way down to today, which happens to be the 4th of April here in New Zealand. I know it's probably the 3rd of April for most of you. Um, okay, now let's add some columns. I'm going to create a new variable called add years equals. Now I'm going to use the add columns function to add a column to my base table variable. The column I'm going to add is going to be called year. And the DAX expression I'm going to use is going to suck out the year value from the date column in the base table table. Now when I click OK, it changes. The reason why nothing is changing here is because we're still returning the base table. So let's return the add, the content of the add years variable now. Click OK. 
we can see that we've added a column. Cool. I'm going to paste code in here so you don't have to suffer my typing. Now, hopefully this is uh, visible and not too small. Usually on a projector, I have to zoom in here. Um, but what I have done here is added another variable called add months. You can call it whatever you like, so long as you don't use any other DAX keyword as your variable name, and you can't use spaces like you can with column names and table names, even if you use the square brackets around the variable names, that, um, that won't help. So, but the variable names aren't exposed anywhere apart from in the DAX calculation that you're working on. So what this is going to do is we're going to add two columns in this case. Um, we're going to add columns to the add years variable and we're going to add a month ID and a month column. And if I change this, I'll bring that down to the return statement, click the OK tick, that's going to add two columns here. And one thing you can't do in DAX is the sort by and hide features. So if I highlight this column and uh, say I would like to sort it by month ID and hide this just to tidy up my report, they're two functions that they're, they're two things you still need the um, UI for. And what I'm going to do now is add two more columns. One of them is called add day, which is using the same pattern of the add columns DAX function. It's going to add columns to the previous variable, the name of the column, and then a DAX expression, which is going to um, generate the, the value for the uh, cell. And we have a start of week here as well. This, this shows a, a nice tidy way that you can um, uh, easily uh, block your days into uh, groups of seven. And if we finally return the last variable, click OK. And here we go. Here's a nice simple date table. Now I can copy and paste this and save this code off to somewhere central in your um, uh, source control system so that when you go and start a brand new DAX model, you can just paste this in. Alternatively, you could have pretty much the same sort of uh, logic set up in Power Query, or if you're lucky enough to have a, um, a data warehouse that already has calendar tables that are optimized and configured for your organization, then they're good too. Probably the main thing I wanted to show you was the DAX pattern of using variables as a nice tidy way to break up what otherwise might be quite a large complex DAX statement. I could have generated all this in a single statement um, in one big long line as well, but I think breaking it out using variables allows me to uh, easily maintain, see what's going on, and, and plus you can throw in comments as well. So here's one way you can create a date table. A nice alternative um, way to, to create a date table, uh, here we go, I'll just throw this in as dates alternative, also uses variables. So we see here of, of the variable of base table establishing the same single column set of rows, um, but we use the generate um, function, which is kind of like a cross-join, Cartesian join, inner join style uh, function to, uh, to allow two tables to join together. We'll have a look at this a little more detail later in the presentation. But here we can see we have some DAX expressions being assigned to variables, and we're returning the row. Year returns the base year uh, DAX expression. Month ID returns the uh, base month ID DAX expression. Uh, and when I click OK, we actually get exactly the same table, but just using a, a, a different um, notation. I do prefer the readability of this alternative one. Um, and like I said, you can extend this to customize your own start of week or, or anything that's um, useful to your, your own organization. So we have three tables in our model. We have our dates alternative, which we will park. We have a date table and we have a numbers table. So the next table I'd like to generate is a sales table. And I'm going to combine my numbers and dates table to generate what hopefully will be a semi-realistic looking date, a sales table with um, product IDs and quantities and, and prices and totals. And so let's, let's jump into that. So jumping back to our modeling window, we're going to create a new table and we're going to call this 
sales equals uh, first table equals. What I'm going to do is generate eights with numbers. Now remember we've created two tables already in our in our model and they are called dates and numbers. The generate function is going to smash them together in a Cartesian way and we're going to get a, the, the number of rows for every row from dates combined with every row from numbers. So let's see what that looks like. Return first table. Okay. Here we go. So when I sort by date, the 1st of January, and it, we, we see every single column from the dates table and every single column from the numbers table, which happens to be one. If I scroll down, we will see the numbers table uh, hit 100, and then we'll flick over to the 2nd of January. So what we have is a table with 82,500 rows, which is probably uh, reflective of we have 825 days since the 1st of January or between the 1st of January and today and that's been multiplied out by 100 rows from the numbers table but I don't want exactly the same number of sales for every single day I want to mix I want a randomized mix of um, sales per day so I'm going to filter my table and I'm going to use as my filter condition the value of n which is our last column is less than a random number. So ran between, say, 2 and 7. Now what this is going to do, if I sort by the 1st of January, is for every single day, it's going to return a, a random number of rows between, I'm always going to have at least two rows, but I'm never going to have more than seven rows. So we see here for the 1st of January, we have four rows. For the 2nd of January, we have three rows. For the 3rd of January, we have two. So it's kind of mixed up, not massively, um, but I could easily tweak this by just simply changing the parameters of the two and the seven here if I wanted to create more. Um, equally, I could increase the number of values in my numbers table. So if I really wanted to quickly generate 2 million rows so I could test a DAX calculation on production like data then this is a useful and quick way to quickly generate data. Um, now I don't want to have all of these columns in my table I just want to grab the um, date table so I'm going to use the select columns function that I used earlier but in this case it's not designed to just simply do a rename what I'm doing here is I'm picking and choosing the um, columns that I want to bring back to my core sales table. So I want to suck out the... Hey, column. Bill, um, yeah. I have uh, two requests uh, from Saat and Safat. Is there a Zoom that's actually in that status bar? If you do a Control Plus, it doesn't work here, does it? Uh, it may do. I, I don't probably... think it does. I don't think it does. Uh, go ahead and do a Control Plus for me. And no, it yeah, it doesn't work. It so I I have been listening to your yep. comments. Oh, it is working. So you actually have Zoom it installed. Okay, because it's not in a native function. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I do, I do this in presentations when it's on a big screen, and and there are people down the back of the room that are squinting at the. Uh, <laughs> at and we the have board. we have we have people in I think it's Greece, and sure. Turkey who are squinting. So if if you could zoom in once in a while, that'd be great. Okay, but just as a reminder, I will be making this PBIX file and my notes available in links so that you can download this and study it in more detail as well. But I will use the Zoom, so that's that's fantastic feedback. Thanks, Chuck. Well, we have a basis of our sales table. We have a, a random number of days, which we can tweak. I'll stick with the values that I, I put in. Uh, and now what I'm going to start doing is adding columns to our sales table. So the next column I'm going to add, I can zoom in on this. is going to add a product column. We're going to use the same pattern that we've been using for the date table. So I'm going to add a column to my variable. I'm going to, in this case, add a column called product. Now here's what I want to sort of uh, focus on for this excerpt. What I'm doing here is I'm using the var keyword again. Now this, what this is doing at this point is instigating a new level of variable scope. So we now have what we call a nested variable. So I've, I've created a variable called make, and I'm going to assign it a random number between 65 and 90. Um, I'm going to create another variable called my model, which is going to have a, 
a random number between one and five. And then finally, I'm going to smash these two variables together to generate a product code. So let's have a look at what that looks like, and then I'll explain um, a little more, more about what that's doing. OK. OK, so you can see I'm creating sort of realistic looking product codes, triple U hyphen one, triple L hyphen five, triple T hyphen M. So the, the triple nature of the letters is the repeat function is creating three of my make. Now my make is just a number between 65 and 90. Now they are the ASCII codes for the uppercase letters A through Z. So what we're generating in this case is probably a number quite late in this, in this say, 85. And we're using the unichar function to convert that back to its ASCII character. Now, that's, that's a fantastic function that you can do for things like KPIs and emojis and widgets and thumbs up and thumbs up, thumbs down. It's a great one to explore. And we're simply concatenating with the my model, um, which is generated here. So we'll, we'll never have a number between uh, we'll only ever have a number between one and five and we're using the standard microsoft format string syntax which converts the number or places the number into the to the hash so um, that's how we that's how i'm generating that but probably the most important aspect of this function is i'm using nested variables nested variables can reference um, variables that were declared and used at a higher level but you can't do that in um, uh, the other way and I am using the return statement here to close out this um, this this the scope um, I'm going to use a nested variable in my next statement and I'll show you um, that the IntelliSense is smart enough to know that I can't use make or my model so let's let's do that let's um, let's add a quantity column oh let's actually yep we've done that so da -da -da. The add quantity statement is, is a little easy to follow. There, run it, and let's zoom in. Okay, so we're using the pattern of we're adding columns to the variable, and it's in my case, it's the variable that I just created. I'm going to call the column quantity, and here I'm instigating a new level of variable scope here with this var statement, and, and that var statement has a return. Um, if I try to access my make and model variables for earlier, var x equals just doesn't exist. Whereas if I had tried this higher up, it works. But that one's closed. So coming back down. Um, now what I'm trying to do here is for my quantity, I again want to make the data semi-realistic. So I don't want to have an even number of single purchases, an even number of, um, or as I don't want to have the same number of single purchases to double purchases to triple purchases. So I'm using the logarithmic function to try and tail off the number of uh, purchases made. Now this might be a little easier to show if I can if I visualize this using a great tool called Power BI. So let's have a look to see if this logarithmic func function has allowed me to distribute the value of um, ones to fives in this column. So if we zoom back out, jump to Power BI, and go to the report canvas view, have a look at my field that I've just created, um, quantity into a bar chart, and quantity on the axis. So we can see here that the number of single purchases was almost double those of double purchases, almost again higher, and then we tail off down to the five. So that 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 works nicely, but you can see how we're using DAX expressions inside the return statement, inside nested variables to generate data on the fly that we need, and it's very quick because DAX, as you know, is a very powerful and fast engine. So finally, let's um, close out our sales table with a price and total column. If we throw these in, zoom in. So we're simply adding a price column, which is going to divide the scientific notation, a random um, number between one and 10,000. It's gonna divide that value by 100 so that we can have some dollars and cents. And then we're going to add a total column, which is using a, an expression based on columns added in the same DAX statement. So price and quantity as columns only existed 
um, a couple of lines up but this shows that you can access those and use them inside DAX expressions. So let's have a look to see what that now looks like in, as our sales table. There we go. So hopefully we might have some double sales here. Uh, if I sort by something else, there we go. So uh, we sold three here for a price of this with a total. Oh, that's a quite a nice total. So that's that's pretty cool. Let's tidy up our model and create some relationships. Sales to date. And we can hide the numbers table just to be tidy. Wonderful. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to do is uh, imagine our sales table is very, very large, um, 10 million, 100 million rows. Uh, a a trap I often see people fall into is they bring in a very large um, fact table into DAX, which is fine. But what they then do is they, they create visuals sitting on top of that very large table. And often the granularity of the visual is much higher than the lowest level of detail in the fact table. Um, so what does that mean? Um, let's say we have a sales table with lots and lots of sales data that even goes down to the minute of the day and it's very, very large. Um, but in the report canvas, someone has created a line chart that only goes down to the, the day at the very least or, or perhaps even the month. Um, a, a good technique to make um, the report engine run faster is to create a summary version of your sales table that's aggregated just to the lowest level of grain needed for the visuals on the canvas um, and what you'll find is that DAX will obviously have a lot less work to do um, and your report user experience will be a lot nicer. So our sales table has um, how many rows? 2,800, that's, that's pretty fast anyway. So let's, but let's make a summary version of this table down to day, um, which is gonna take in our case as, as many as seven lines down to one. So we're going to go to new table. I'm gonna call this daily, daily summary. In fact, I'll paste this in. as we can. I need to, what's, why is this complaining? I'm going to just scratch that and start again, new table. Paste this in. Okay. Daily summary is already in our table. I'll just fix this typo then. Columns. Sales. Dates. I see what the problem is. There's an S. Wonderful. So we're using the DAX function called summarize columns. There are three aggregation functions inside DAX. There's summarize, summarize columns, and group by. They each have slightly different um, uh, use cases where they will be the best of the three and I do detail that in my book generally for the most common scenarios they're fairly interchangeable particularly on smaller um, rows um, my go-to and my preferred one is the summarize columns um, it will in most cases be the fastest and easiest one to to use so what this is going to do is it's summarizing our sales table down to one row per day and we're creating two columns daily item solved daily revenue and here's the DAX expression going to be used. So that's great. Um, if I go back to my relationship view, relate this to my date table, what that now means is if I was to create a sum of daily revenue using my new table versus the original table, it's going to be a lot faster. Um, remember every single time, every single dot on a line chart or bar chart has to execute its own distinct DAX calculation. So the less work that that has to do, the faster your report will run. So let's go daily revenue. Cool. So if I was to copy this visual down, rather than use the daily revenue from daily summary, but the revenue from 
my sales table. Now these charts, the top and the bottom one, will be identical. However, if we're talking a sales table or a fact table with a, a large number of rows, the one at the bottom, while it returns exactly the same result, will have to work a lot harder to, to generate the same result. So this is why when you use a summary table, it's going to be a um, uh, a better experience for your users um, and I believe there might be some things on the radar that we saw in a in a roadmap release about a week ago from Microsoft that's going to make this a little easier to do I'm really excited to look forward to, to seeing a lot more detail about this um, hopefully we'll find out more at the uh, the data insight summit okay so now that I've created a calculated table on a calculated table, let's add a calculated measure to this, um, just to show that you can. So in my daily summary table, I'm going to add a measure, which is going to be the rolling average. Now I'm not going to go into detail about the, um, the pattern here. This is the standard DAX pattern that you are likely to use, but it's running a, um, a, a rolling average over my new summary table that I just created, not the original um, sales table so I go okay let's bring that rolling average into the visual and if I put a slicer over the top of this so a slicer to make this a little easier to see well let's make it a line chart so we can see the the smooth line so the smooth the, the smooth dark line is the measure that we just created. So that's showing the calculated measure on a calculated table on a calculated table that combines our dates and, and um, uh, sales calculated table. Okay, so one of the things I always like to address in my DAX is the common question of when should I create a calculation as a calculated column and when should I create a calculation as a calculated measure? Um, for a lot of things you do, they they almost look the same and, and there is an awful lot of overlap. So um, the way I like to explain the difference between a calculated column and a calculated measure is it's the calculations will execute at different points in time. So with a calculated yeah, I'm real quick. Um, yeah. Pastovi Andre, and I'm sorry if I just destroyed your first name, Andre. Um, <laughs> If there are multiple date fields in the order table, such as order date, payment date, shipping date, how do you use the same date table for all of the date fields? Okay, what you can do is take advantage of um, DEX relationships. Now you can create as many DEX relationships between your fact table and your date table as you like. So if you do have three columns in your fact table, such as order ship date, you can create three relationships to your date table. Um, you can only specify one of those to be default or the, the DAX terminology is active. Now the one you specify as being active means you don't have to write any code and any all your DAX calculations that reference columns in both tables will automatically assume that's, that's the relationship you want to use. And you can turn them on and off as at will and you can control which one is active, but you can only have one at a time. If you want to use one of the other relationships, you have to use you have to write that relationship rule into your DAX calculation. And there's a function called use relationship, which um, allows you to do that. Um, I'll add that to my notes and I'll update that, but um, that's the mechanism that allows you to have a single date table connected to your fact table multiple times. So yes, it's possible, but you do need to hard code a, um, a use relationship function into your calculation, but it works well, it, 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 um, it will work for you. So. That makes I perfect hope, sense. Thank you very much. That was a great I, question too, by the way. Yeah, no, I hope that has uh, made sense. So, so calculated columns versus calculated measures depends on the point in time that they actually, well, they only, they execute at different points. So with a calculated column, a calculated column will only ever execute at the point in time the data is refreshed or loaded into your model. So it executes once, the output of the, the calculate calculation is put into the column and then that column is written to your data footprint. It's as if you got that column in that format from the source system that you were importing from. Now the, the calculated column code does not execute again. So the values in each row of that column cannot be changed by anything. Remember that DAX has no concept of update, insert or delete. So they're locked in stone. 
um, filters can be applied to decide to limit which rows are visible or which rows might be used by calculations, but they cannot change the values inside the column generated by a calculated column. I'm saying lots of C words here. <laughs> Hopefully I don't trip up over myself. Calculated measures, on the other hand, when you write your calculation and go save, it doesn't execute. It's sitting there dormant. It's, it's not going to do anything. The only time a calculated measure will actually execute is when you drag it onto the report canvas and use it in a visual. Um, so if you have a line chart with 10 points, your calculated measure will execute 10 times when you drag it onto the canvas. If you have a bar chart with 100 values, 100 columns, your calculated measure will execute 100 times over and over and over again, each in the, the, the filter context um, of the, the axis where it's sitting in. Now, this is a practical session. We're not going to be talking uh, much about the theory of filter context. But when calculated measures execute, the result of the calculated measure is used to generate the value for the point. It's not stored in the physical model. So it makes no impact whatsoever on your data footprint size for the model. Um, but you have to understand that every time you make a data selection or make a filter change, any, any data point on your visual, on your canvas, will re-execute that calculated measure. So it's busy recalculating over and over and over and over again. So what you need to do is make sure that any code you put in a calculated measure is fast, snappy, and really efficient. Calculated columns, on the other hand, you can afford to make those calculations maybe take 10 or 15 or 20 seconds to execute because the chances are, if you have a model that's only importing data once a day and it's happening at two in the morning, it doesn't matter. Okay. So let's have a look at this in practice because this, this session is called Practical DAX after all. So what I'm going to do is um, show you two very, very similar measures um, that do exactly the same thing. Um, one is going to be a calculated column, one is going to be a calculated revenue so, uh, a measure. So let's have a look at this. So what I'm going to do to my summary table is add a cumulative um, value. One is going to be, I'm going to have a column that shows the calculated revenue accumulating, and the other will be as a measure. Um, and you'll notice that the pattern is very similar. Both start with a calculate function. Both use exactly the same DAX expression, which is to sum uh, our revenue column. Um, we have a, we're going to be using filter to work out how to, to do the cumulative nature of this, this measure. Um, so let's add these column. Let's add these um, calculations. So first of all, uh, I'm going to take the calculated revenue as column add it over here, so new column, and paste that in, and this is going to be the daily revenue, and dates, and dates, and go OK, and just to make sure, jump to my data view, daily summary now has a new column that is accumulating by the amount of daily revenue. So that's good. Now that executed at that point, stored, that calculation will not execute again. Let's go and grab my calculated measure version. I'm going to add a measure to the same table. Add this guy in. Okay, fix my pluralizing. Okay, remember this code is not going to execute yet. It will not execute until I use it in my report canvas. So let's let's add that to our report canvas. So we have, um, I'm going to my date table. I'm going to create a table in this case. And I'm going to add my calculated, uh, let's turn this into days. Calculated revenue as column and calculated revenue as measure. And if we zoom in, what we'll see is these these are producing exactly the same value if i scroll all the way to the end which i won't do because there's 800 days there they are exactly the same value so in this particular case there's no difference and if this is what i was trying to achieve i would be far better to create this as a column rather than a measure so what's the difference between the two okay let's copy this turn it into a line chart 
and you see the lines are sitting on top of each other. We have the, um, uh, the two items there. If I throw a filter onto the canvas, and let's filter by year. Turn this into a list of years. If I click 2017, what's happening here? The calculated revenue of column, the filter is just simply throwing out some rows and we're just showing on the screen the values that were calculated five minutes ago. It's not thinking, all it's doing is retrieving some data and just sticking it on the screen. So it's very quick. However, the measure is recalculating, but in the context of the filters and the rows it's allowed to now see. So um, the reason why the numbers are now different is because the value for the 1st of January 2017 um, for the measure, this is all it's got to work with. It can't see any of the rows of 2016, so it has to start with zero, but it is calculating. It is taking however long it takes to um, execute that calculation for every single cell in this column. Now, what I'm going to do is jump to um, show you some quite useful tools to help optimize and see what's going on under the covers. And we're going to have a look at the, um, the difference in speed between these um, two calculations. So a tool that I really, really recommend uh, is DAX Studio. And I've got an icon here on my desktop. We're going to fire this up. If you haven't used this already, it's a, um, I highly recommend it. It's a free tool. It's optimized for um, helping you write better decks. Um, uh, I actually, there's a couple more questions. I've been, I was yeah, actually please. answering a question for Hero about um, splitting columns, nothing to do with what you're talking about. And Sunil is asking, why is the grand total changing? So I actually wasn't looking at your screen. I don't know what he's Oh, the very about. bottom? Yeah. So the total line? Yes. So the, the reason why they are different is because they are calculations in their own right. The grand total at the um, in the middle column is actually summing, uh, I think, every single column in here um, because this is what's known as an implicit calculation. So we're not just simply placing on the value from the column. There is a um, DAX is creating an implicit sum of my uh, the, the value in the row. So... Um, the, the the very large number here is just a sum of every single value above it, which is a static value. Whereas over here, this calculation is a, um, a calculation in its own right, and it should probably match the very last total there. Yeah, because this is doing what the DEX calculation asked, and it's doing a sum of here with respect to these filters. Um, but these filters are being, they, they are taking on the explicit filter coming from the slicer, um, again, I do cover this in quite a lot of detail in my chapter on filters from my book, um, but that's my quick fire answer. I could probably spend an hour just talking about I, filter I, context. I, no, I think you got it, and, and Rothbardo actually was answered it in situ as well, so I think we're there. Thank oh, you fantastic. For... Excellent. So let's jump back to DAX Studio. So if, you, if you've ever used a, a, um, a query IDE, uh, this should be quite familiar to you. One thing I really like about DAX Studio is that you can connect directly to your DAX model, my, my Power BI um, desktop. So I'm going to do that by clicking here in my um, connection dialog. I'm going to connect. So I am in fact connected to my Power BI desktop file. I can write um, DAX against this. Uh, evaluate, I want to evaluate my dates table. And that's going to, when I run this, it's going to return my dates table. I can filter my dates table to only show me uh, dates, dates month, year equals 2016, run that. And this is a great place to test and build your your DAX calculations, because once you have it right in here, you can paste it back into your um, Power BI window. And there's some um, there's some neat features like just simply formatting your query. This will tidy your very, very long strings into nice, even breaks. Um, uh, it'll introduce line breaks, etc. cetera. Um, you, can output the six, you can output the results of these files to, the output the results of the queries to files. If you want to just do one-off ad hoc extracts of um, your data model, that might be a useful thing to do. Um, you can clear cache when you run, um, but the features that I really quite like 
Deck Studio 4, understanding what's going on under the covers. So let's have a look at the two calculations that we just created, the calculate, um, uh, the cumulative measure by columns and measures. Sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll just grab those as DAX calculations and paste them in and you'll see what I mean. So let's evaluate this, paste this in into this window, sorry. Okay. So what this is going to do, when I clear cache and run, and hit the old run button, this is going to return to the screen exactly the same table that we just generated in Power BI Desktop. So we have a column of dates and we're showing our um, calculate revenue as column and calculate revenue as measure. But let's see which, how each one performs. So if I comment out second column, rerun, we're saying we're only querying the calculate revenue as column. But let's turn on our server timings and our query plan. I'm going to run this now and not focus on the output. I'm going to jump to the server timings. If we zero in down here, this corner, what I'm really interested in is the output of this uh, section of the result panel. Um, and it's telling me that it took 10 milliseconds to satisfy that query. And of that 10 milliseconds, it spent 9 milliseconds in the formula engine and 1 millisecond in the storage engine. SE for storage engine, FE for formula engine. Now, if you want your DAX queries to run quickly, you want them to be doing as much work as they can in the storage engine. And all the storage engine does is simply go to the memory and retrieve the data and present it. Doesn't do anything. Whereas the formula engine, actually performs calculations and um, does your number crunching. So let's have a look at how the other calculation, the measure, um, stacks up. So we comment out our calculated column and show the calculated measure. Clearication run. We're going to get the same result set. But when we look at the server timings, we'll see some quite different numbers here. So it wasn't 10 milliseconds, it was 220 milliseconds. Um, we spent a large number of amount of that time, 98% in the formula engine. And that's because to generate this data, it had to be doing this calculation over and over and over again. Um, how many rows were there returned? I think it was 816 from memory. Uh, it's just going to tell us 825 rows. So our calculated measure actually executed 825 times, each in a slightly different context because it had to consider the day um, that was being passed into it. Um, and the total amount of time it took to satisfy those 825 calculations is 217 milliseconds. Now that's not bad, but compared to 10 milliseconds, I know which I would rather prefer. So getting back to the original question, when should I use a calculated measure? When should I use a calculated um, column. We know there's lots of overlap, but if you're bringing in data to your model that you know that you're not, you don't want to have it changed by filters that you're going to present to your user, then by far a calculated column is the better one to use. However, if you want your uh, numbers to be responsive, to be dynamic, to respect filters and selections, then yes, definitely use a calculated measure, but use tools like um, DAX Studio, where you can see and understand how much of the time the calculated measure is, is um, spending in the formula engine versus the storage engine, uh, then you could rewrite it. You can often write a calculation in six different ways. Um, often um, there are new DAX function, functions coming out that at the surface look like they do as a previous DAX function and it's not clear why we're getting a new function when um, we've had another one for years that seems to work fine but the new function uh, can satisfy the um, uh, result uh, by by using the storage engine much more effectively and, and do the uh, spend a lot less time in the formula engine so this is a this is a great tool to um, to use to to get into um, optimizing your calculation so hopefully that makes sense and um, uh, is useful. What you can also see for the T-SQL gurus uh, amongst us in the um, execution plan are these pseudo T-SQL statements saying exactly what the um, calculation actually did. So in this case, it, a select um, uh, date sum of daily revenue. There's probably a group by somewhere along this um, 
uh, statement if I if I double click on it. Maybe not. Um, another great use of Dex Studio is being able to run DMVs against your model. Um, some useful DMVs that I like to run, um, uh, perhaps uh, object memory usage. If I double click on this line here and, and run this as what looks like a T-SQL statement, this will spit out a result set that I can export to a file or uh, import to a, a Power BI model that shows for every single object inside your model exactly how much um, uh, memory it's using. So um, I, I have used this quite effectively on models where I will um, point it at a, at, a, at a Power BI desktop file. It will say, hey, you've got these columns over here that are using 90% of your memory. I'll double check to see whether those columns are being used anywhere. And um, if they're not, I'll be able to delete them safely and um, shrink the, the data model down. In an extreme case, I, I worked with an analyst who sucked in every table they thought they needed to use. And when, when they went file save as, their Power BI desktop file was 800 megabytes. Uh, it was a very big model. I used this DMV and I, I, I only identified probably two or three um, identity columns. These were highly unique columns and very large tables. We knew we weren't gonna be needing them or using them for the report. We deleted the columns. We resaved the Power BI file and it was 40 megs. It was a massive difference. Um, it was so much faster to use, so much faster to save, so much faster to publish and um, import data for. So I do highly recommend um, some of these DMVs as alternative ways to make your um, models faster. Another one I like is the um, tabular model schema measures. When we run this DMV, this is gonna output a result set that will show you the calculated measures in the um, table. Um, we can see their names and we can see the formulas that we used as well. So this could be a useful um, calculation to help you build out your documentation. You can run multiple queries at a time. Um, what else can you do? There's, there's all sorts. Dex Studio is, is fantastic. It's free and they update it regularly. So I highly recommend you download it if you, if you haven't already got it. If you have got it, use it more. The other um, tool that I like to use when I'm optimizing is SQL Server Management Studio. If you're already using T-SQL or other SQL Server tools, you probably have this already. It is free, but it is so an actually, 800- Actually, on that topic, I'm gonna interrupt just for a second. Sunil's asking, because you're actually gonna cover that right now, you're you're on the cusp of that, is calculated column may take, oh, we just scrolled right off the top. Calculated columns may take a lot of time. How do you go out and take a look at the performance heuristics and actually go out and optimize that? Now take it away, Phil. Okay, so you can use Dex Studio um, to suck out the calculations and run it in Dex Studio, and that'll give you the breakdowns of the query, the execution plan, and, and the, the timings as we just shown. Um, or you can use SQL Server um, Profiler, which we'll jump into. So what I need to do is jump back to Dex Studio to get the port number that Power BI is listening on. And if we zoom down into the status bar, we can see that we're using 61776. If I close and reopen Power BI Desktop, it'll be on a different port. There are tricks that you can use to lock this down. Um, um, but let's grab that 61776. See how my memory is at this time. 61776. Now, SQL Server Management Studio is um, about 800 megs if you want to download it. It is free. And when you do fire it up, you want to connect to analysis services server type. That's a um, fancy way of saying my Power BI desktop model. Um, and you do need to put in the port number that's relevant for your instance. Let's connect to this. Uh, and we can actually see my model. I can even run MDX. Who here likes MDX? You all do? Fantastic. Uh, states, states, states. So this is running MDX against a Power BI model. Not useful for anything at all, except for the fact that, um, oh, not returning anything, doesn't matter. The main thing I wanted to share with you about SQL Server Management Studio is a fantastic tool called Profiler. Now that I'm connected to my Power BI desktop model, what I can do is hit Profiler. I can turn on a bunch of events such as Query events, begin, begin, end. There are other ones I could turn on. Let's, let's stick with that. This is clear. If I jump back to my Power BI model now and start doing some things, you'll see the events are appearing here. And let's go to my calculated column 
and maybe make a slight change. Let's just break this calculation by doing this. Run. There we go. So in the background, I have captured using SQL, uh, using the profiler, uh, a lot of detail about that calculation, including the DAX itself. So this is the DAX that Power BI runs against it. And I can see some um, server timings. And there are other events I can turn on to capture the inner um, steps that the um, calculation actually took. Now, this is really getting into an advanced topic. Um, all I wanted to share and highlight was that it's available, and here's how you can go to get into that. And there are some fantastic blogs, particularly by um, SQL BI, Marco Russo, Alberto Ferrari, about how to interpret the um, execution plan and how you might use that to try and get your measures using more of the storage engine and less of the formula engine. So we have five minutes left. So let's jump back to our model. Um, are there any other questions um, up at that point? Uh, how are we going there, Chuck? We're actually doing really good. There's a couple questions about the uh, exam 778. Um, sure. Have you taken that yet? I have not taken that yet. Okay. No, no, I'm just too cheap. Um, I know it's a fantastic... <laughs> it's a, it look, you know, it hasn't been updated, so it's going to be missing a ton of the latest information. So I can tell the people that are asking, you probably don't need to actually study anything that's been introduced in the last eight months because it hasn't been touched since then. Um, I, I am aware that it's quite broad. It covers a lot of aspects of Power BI, including some um, Power Query syntax. Yep. So if you are used to just using Power Query using the UI, the fact, I mean, and let's face it, yeah, you, you, got do you definitely have to do SMM, yeah. Yeah, so, but if you if you can pretty much do 98% of whatever you need using the buttons on the toolbar in Power Query, if that's all you do, then you probably need to brush up on your um, basic and really common um, uh, Power Query. There will be some helpers. I think there are some um, sample tests and, and, and ways that you can just, just brush yourself up before De you do that. Devin Knight on, at Pragmatic Works has a huge blog post on it. So, uh, oh, yeah. Kieran, check out uh, Devin Knight's uh, blog post, and he's one of our MVPs. Okay, go ahead. I don't want to steal your last nine minutes away from you. No, I'm always jealous when I look at the um, uh, people who post on Twitter that, that hey, I've passed it now, so I, I do need to get around to that. Um, so, okay. So, how long have we got? Five minutes or nine minutes? So, my uh, clock is actually, three. My, yeah, I was going to say, my clock is wrong, as we know. So we probably whatever your clock is, we don't want to go late. No, I don't want to go late. It's, it's saying 57 minutes past. And the next thing I'm going to launch into is, is quite long. I'll just share you the screen of my notes, because this is what I'm going to post into the, um, the channel, probably the YouTube, YouTube channel. So if I scroll up to the top, we can see all the calculations that I have used. I know this is a bit boring, but as we come down, I have got comments here. Um, today, we've managed to get up to here. Uh, these are the calculations. So after here, I have got some um, quite neat decks that talks about how you might use um, uh, different summarize approaches and techniques. Again, using uh, variables, we're going to look at the uh, using natural and a join. So these will be concepts more familiar to T-SQL people. Um, Summarize, cross-join, um, alternative techniques for ranking, double grouping. So when you want to do an average on an average, that's often uh, not as straightforward as you might expect using DAX. Um, and it's where the group by function comes into its own. So you can see that used here. Um, again, I, I try and explain what the calculation is going to do. Um, I'm available. Um, you can you can definitely contact me on Twitter, LinkedIn, email for questions. Obviously, my book is available. Um, probably the last section of this of these notes, which I find really helpful, are uh, showing different techniques of inner joins. Um, some hacks around how to get inner join working when they're coming from two different uh, lineage tables. And finally, a neat example about how you can pivot. Um, uh, perhaps staff and days into a, um, a visual that you can present to see how many people we have active at any particular time. So we're really showing how you might use DAX to pivot columns to rows or rows to columns. So I will make sure that that's available um, attached to this webinar. So unless there are any other questions, um, Chuck? There aren't. We're actually doing really, really good. And I'm going to actually post in the last link for the exam, and that's actually by one of my coworkers named Dusty, a good guy out of Florida. And yep. we're actually going to have uh, Phil close it. So thank you very much, close. Or thank you very much, Phil. No, no worries. No, it's been good fun. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop the broadcast. Hang on a second for me, if you unless you got the yeah. ones out. Okay, thank you.